All aboard for the Terror Train review, or risk being left on the platform with a cutlass in your stomach. Terror Train is a 1980 slasher film directed by Roger Spottiswood and starring Jamie Lee Curtis. I know Spottiswood from the James Bond film he directed in 1997. Tomorrow Never Dies, a fairly middle-of-the-road Bond film in terms of its quality, but I was certainly interested to see this film from much earlier in his career in the horror genre. Jamie Lee obviously needs no introduction. She was coming into this film on the back of an incredible run of horror films, Halloween, The Fog, Prom Night. Not everybody will like all of those films, but I personally do, so I was absolutely fascinated to see if she could make it four in a row with me. As to whether she did or not, I'll tell you in a minute, but first let's quickly go through the plot. This is a story about a group of medical students who, to celebrate the end of their academic year, have booked themselves onto a boozy train ride to I don't know where, we're never told. They're the sort of trains that have live-in compartments so you can stay overnight. We're never told the itinerary, but I presume that it's just going to be a one-night thing and then in the morning when they're all suffering from hangovers, they'll spin the train around and bring them back to the same station from when they left. But before we get to that point, a killer starts picking them off one by one. It's an ex-student who used to be on the same course as them, but they all played a prank on him that went horribly wrong and he ended up in a psychiatric ward, but now he's back for revenge. Now, I will reveal at this point, I really did like this film and I almost feel predispositioned to liking this because obviously I like slasher films, but I also love trains. It's my favorite mode of transport. I've loved trains since I was a kid. And I've always wanted to go on one of those holidays where you sleep on a train and then every day you get taken to a different location. We don't have those sorts of holidays in the UK, sadly, but I know they do them in other countries. And I believe they do them in Canada where this film was actually shot and is presumably set. So hopefully I'll get to tick that particular want off my bucket list. I'll quickly show you the version of the film I have. It's a Blu-ray from 88 Films. It's got a couple of audio commentaries on there, one of which I've watched, and a bunch of other bits and bobs. It's also got this booklet that comes with it. I love it when films come with booklets. It's got a couple of essays about the film and an interview with Derek McKinnon, who plays the killer, which is a good way for me to actually transition into talking more about the killer in Terror Train. His character name is Kenny, and even though he seems like a bit of a dweeb at the start of the film, he's anything but once he gets knife happy. His big MO is that he likes to take on the fancy dress mask of the person he's just killed. Oh yeah, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that it's a fancy dress night on the train. And what this allows Kenny to do is to just walk around without anybody being able to recognise him. I don't know if the changing of the mask is a tactical thing or whether he, it's just something he wants to do. Supposedly, Kenny is in exactly 11 scenes in this film and he has a different mask or costume in every single one of them. I can only think of five or six of his different looks off the top of my head though. So possibly there are scenes that he's in where we, the viewer, don't even know he's there because possibly it's a crowd scene and Kenny's wearing a mask that we've not previously seen him in. I'd love to see a YouTube video where somebody just strings together all of his scenes in a row so we can see what these secret appearances are, if they exist, but I did check and nobody's done anything like that yet. I did think the film was putting Kenny a little bit too much front and centre on the screen in front of us near the beginning, but thankfully as the story goes on he seems to appear less and less, at least until the finale, which does make it quite a scary film. He's got a very handy skill of being able to kill people in a crowded room as well without anybody being able to see who did the killing. He does this twice, one of which is at the start on the platform before the train even leaves. So there's one unlucky actor who for the rest of his career will be able to tell people, oh, I was in Terror Train. I didn't actually get onto the train, but I had a good time. It is a shame for that guy because the inside of the train is brilliantly designed. It must have been a lot of fun to act in that environment. It feels almost multicoloured at times, the interior, and yet still gloomy. It's still brightly lit that you can see what's going on and yet there's a shadowy kind of feel to most of the carriages which does make it believable that somebody could sneak in on a group and kill someone and get out without being noticed. There's a lot of variety with the carriages as well which is good. Don't get an image in your head of carriage after carriage with rows of seats in them. There's nothing commercial about this train. Even the living compartments have some variety. So you've got your private compartments that a character like Doc can afford and then there's at least one other carriage that has nothing but rows of bump beds in there. 
There's a dining carriage, an entertainment carriage, a staff carriage where just the conductor and the driver might hang out. There's lots of good exterior shots of snowy Canada. I'd have liked a bit more of those actually. And I think at least one of those shots might have been reused, but I'm not sure. Going back to Doc's compartment, that was probably my favorite kill in the film actually. I mean, he locks himself in this place and he thinks he's safe at first, but then he realizes that there are plenty of little spots in that room that a killer could potentially hide. So he grabs something sharp and starts poking inside like the overhead luggage compartment and underneath the seats, except he's doing it more slowly than what I'm doing it. It's almost unbearably slow how he goes about this process, but you're thinking to yourself, oh God, Kenny's going to pop out at any moment, and sure enough, he does. And I actually think that uh, Doc could have taken Kenny, given the respective statures of the two men, but Doc is so paralysed by everything that's happened on the night so far that he can't even bring himself to look at Kenny, or even accept that it might be him, you know, doing this. So he, he refuses to even look at him, and in the end, he makes Kenny's job very, very easy. Doc was played by Hart Bochner, who went on to play that cokehead character Ellis in Die Hard. Very good actor, though, seems to play annoying people because Doc is annoying in this film and so was Ellis in Die Hard. The other characters were quite hit and miss for me. Some of them came across as really cocky and pretentious, actually, as if somehow by being medical students that made them it. I did like Jamie Lee's Elena, though. Having said that, when do I ever dislike a Jamie Lee character? And there was this other guy who, I forget his name, but he wears glasses and he's, his costume is that of an American president. He was a nice kid. And he does a really good impression at one point of an American presidential candidate, which was quite funny. He got the accent absolutely down pat. David Copperfield is in this film. I don't think he had any prior acting experience coming into this, but he's got a real presence. And the scenes with him and Jamie Lee and them carried quite a bit of um, chemistry to them, shall we say. He's kind of set up as a red herring, this character. You know, you're sort of enticed into thinking that maybe he's a relative of Kenny getting revenge on his behalf, maybe an older brother, but he's not. And I, I was glad about that because I did like that magician. I, I'm not sure his tricks were actually real. I mean, some of them were just a little bit far-fetched. There's one where him, he's at one end of, the, of a room. There's a crowd in the middle. His assistant is at the other end. And suddenly they sort of click their fingers and they've swapped spaces within... The, about two seconds. I, yeah, there were, there were a few tricks like that where I thought, come on, that can't be a real magician's trick. But the crowd were there sort of clapping away as if it, it had happened in this train carriage. But yeah, I, I had my doubts. Though on the audio commentary I listened to, they seem to think that all these tricks could genuinely be done by David Copperfield. So who knows? Uh, Derek McKinnon does very well, given the fact that I don't think he'd ever acted before. He was in Cabaret before he got this role. Um, but the few scenes where, you know, you see him up close and personal, he, he's very convincing as this creepy little killer. Um, but easily my favourite character of all was Ben Johnson as this train conductor guy. I, when he turns up at the start of the film, I instantly thought, oh, this is going to be a throwaway character who's sort of, you know, the second or third kill about half an hour in. But he just kept surviving and kept surviving. And he's got some really cool character traits, like he sells camper vans when he's not working on trains and... He's something of an amateur magician practicing all these really bad card tricks compared to the standard of David Copperfield anyway. And he was really calm whenever he discovered a dead body in the, in a bathroom or something. You know, he didn't sort of panic and be all annoying. He, he just calmly took it in his stride and decided how best to go about things from then on. So, yeah, I really enjoyed this performance. Apparently, Ben Johnson was quite a famous actor back in like the 50s and 60s and he won an Oscar at some point. But... I've honestly never heard of him at all before watching this film the other day, but yeah, very good, good screen presence. We talk about the finale now. It is an exciting face-off between Kenny and Elena, or Alana, depending on how you pronounce it. I would have liked to have seen a chase that went the whole length of the train, sort of like a greatest hits of all the carriages we've seen up to that point. Although I don't know how you would have got all the other characters off the train, so that could have happened, but what we do get is fine. If I had to name any more negatives aside from one or two annoying characters, the way that the conductor kills Kenny at the end is a little bit hokey. I mean, he, he sort of gets kissed by Alana and then he stands up and starts spinning around. And yeah, it's, it's a bit far fetched to think that he would do that, having done all this work to get to this point. But I do like his fall. I like the way that he hits the icy bank rather than just lands in the water. That was good. If I had one more complaint, I'd say that the film is not very gory at all. I mean, when I'm saying that, it's something, you know. It's very much a film about the tension and just enjoying the fact that this is a slasher film on a train. If, you, if, you, if you, that sounds like a good thing to you, then you, you'll probably get some enjoyment out of it. I know I really enjoyed the movie. 
Right, let's get to the bag of terror and find out what sort of score we've got for terror train. So we've got one, two, three, four bloody axes out of five. That is an excellent score. I really like this film. I'm glad I took a punt on it and bought the Blu-ray before I'd even seen it. It's definitely going to go on my shelf and get re-watched quite a bit in the future, I think. Yeah, it's a good one. I like it. Now, we've got a pin for the Horror Locations board today. I'm going to put one in Montreal. It's been a while since I put a pin in the board. And there's also a second pin I need to put in, actually, because a couple of episodes ago, I reviewed Curse of the Werewolf and I forgot to put a pin in the board for Spain, where that film was set. So we've got two pins today, so I'll show a clip of me doing that just after this. But apart from that, that's all for today. I'll be back for another review very, very soon. Until next time, bye-bye. Mm.